14 years before Game of Thrones was ever published, a very different style of book was written by now famous George R. R. Martin, and it was picking up some traction. In 1982, the year Fever Dream came out, Martin was far from the superstar he is now. The 34-year-old was still trying to figure out where he fit in the world of fiction. He previously played with themes of fantasy, science fiction, and horror. Fever Dream is kind of a mix of horror and science fiction. It's a very realistic take on the overdone vampire trope. Nothing all that fantastical about these vampires. It's a standalone novel, which was exactly what I was looking for. Not a crazy long read either. Vampires may be a big selling point to get fans of the trope on board to pick up this book, but there are heavy themes of slavery and the morality of how vampires feed. The story kicks off in 1857 along the Mississippi River. It is funny experiencing white authors tiptoe on the slavery topic. And Martin chose the South for the setting, so you know a lot of words we consider to be slurs now are thrown around liberally in Fever Dream. But of course, the main character has to be pro-abolition. Probably too uncomfortable for Martin to have his hero be walking around with slaves in every chapter. Vampires and slavery are two themes I find particularly overdone and boring in Hollywood and fiction. But when shopping for new books, curiosity got the better of me here. Anyone who reads A Song of Ice and Fire knows how good Martin is at taking from other works of fiction and spinning it to something new and interesting. We don't need to hear about how wrong slavery is for 375 pages, but Martin uses this theme to contrast the morality of how vampires treat people. Few humans in this world still know of their existence, and by 1857, not many are still around despite their crazy long lifespan, thanks to being hunted down and their troubles with reproduction. Vampires in Fever Dream aren't all that extraordinary, just an evolved subspecies of human that are stronger, faster, and have a wild thirst for blood that comes upon them every month at the cost of not being able to last long in the sun before being seriously sunburned. But they can heal their injuries insanely fast. No superpowers like turning into bats or turning their victims into one of them. The main character, Captain Abner Marsh, suddenly becomes involved with presumably the last 20 or so living vampires in the world. Captain Marsh has had so much misfortune in his life running a steamboat business that he takes on a partnership with a very suspicious, flamboyant, and extravagant otherworldly man. Marsh's luck is so bad, men along the Mississippi River consider him cursed. The partner is the very obvious vampire, Joshua York. With all his wealth that he amassed over his life, he promised Marsh the steamboat of his dreams. The deal was too good to be true, but he didn't have much to lose. He names this dreamboat of his Fever Dream after it's built. Marsh just wants to conduct regular steamboat business, transporting people and cargo at record speed, but Joshua York has other plans. Martin puts in a crazy amount of research and attention to detail to drag us into this past world, describing this era of the Mississippi River, steamboating in the dirty south during the 1800s. I can imagine a lot of people will be bored by the excessive steamboat paragraphs. I appreciated it though, despite not giving a single fuck about them. Marsh and Joshua Yor are the bread and butter of this book, one being the simple hero archetype, the other Joshua York having some layers to him. The only other true character is the antagonist introduced very early on, Damon Julian, another very obvious vampire. You can tell this is a very different George R. R. Martin than the man who wrote A Game of Thrones. All other characters, even the vampires, are non-existent. What I mean is they have no characterization. The villain, Damon Julian, saved the book for me. I love reading stories of what happens to someone who lives far beyond the normal limitations of man. I like seeing how writers plan out their actions, how they think, what their mind becomes. And no one knows just how ancient Julian is. His character shows that. A mix of barbaric carnal urges with hints of sophistication. A very scary big bad. God Emperor of Dune may be my favorite book of all time because of how that author handled immortality. Even with the very interesting and complex Julian whose motivations challenge you, the evil villain is confused by the concept of enslaving your own race. I did have to take long breaks to finish this one. Fever Dream dragged real bad three quarters in. I know a lot of older books written in the 80s or even before are a real slow burn. People were just more patient back then I guess, before TikTok brain was a thing. But this is different. Slow burns have to have a big payoff, and though I like this ending, Fever Dream is not a must read. I can see why the extra 80 pages or so were added though. Wanted to make the threat more credible, just didn't make for a good reading experience. The long drag was too high of a cost that stopped me from caring. Now what am I going to do with all this steamboat knowledge? Who am I going to impress with fueling a steam boiler with wood small talk?
is not on the quality of a Game of Thrones or any of the books in the Song of Ice and Fire series, especially when it comes to characters. The book also barely navigates from the main plotline, comparing it to Game of Thrones where there are so many good different plotlines. From the Starks fighting for justice and vengeance, to the real threat beyond the wall, to the actual Game of Thrones. Though in Fever Dream, you can see Martin dabbling in having more than just one main character. Marsh, the far less interesting of the two, just hogged the spotlight a little too much for my liking. My distaste for vampires, zombies, or most horror doesn't make me the target audience. There are some fun mysteries that I think everyone will enjoy, even though what should have been the highs fall flat. I can appreciate the attempts of a twist on the vampire trope, going as far as to even physiologically explain their race. As human as they look, their insides are completely different. Fever Dream is decent if you want a standalone novel when you're not in the mood for a long-winded series of 10 books. I especially would like to hear from people who actually like vampire horror novels, because that's clearly who Martin was trying to attract as a young book. I wouldn't call this a lazy way to grab readers, because Martin in his writing prime could change some things here and there and turn this book into something magical, but that's something that takes a ton of experience, and the luxury of time most young writers don't have. As ironic as it sounds, I do wish the epilogue was longer. This book's epilogue is weak. Lots of pretty words, describing pretty things, but adds very little to the abrupt ending. A story like this could use at least another 5 pages or so in the epilogue, even though I think some cuts to the main plotline would benefit things. This is not a review. I don't think anyone, especially me, is qualified to give a number out of 10 rating to an author as skilled as Martin. He was just getting his feet wet in the writing world with a simple vampire story. A spin on a popular trope to build a fan base, And it worked out for him. Let's all congratulate Martin from the past. I'm gonna keep checking out his older stuff just to see how he puts his take on popular fantasy monsters. See y'all later. Oh, and if you manage to snag this old hardcover copy, I'm jealous as shit.